Today we're going to be talking about how to implement a multi-tenant relationship-based authorization model with OpenFGA. Evan, so, can you I'm Evan Anderson. Um, I'm working at Stacklock, and one of our two products is a um, supply chain security platform that we intend to host for everybody to secure their open source projects. It's free for open source projects, and then at some point we'll have licensing for commercial stuff. But we're Series A startups, so we're starting with product market fit before we figure out all the fun billing stuff that I'll get to learn about next quarter. Um, previously, I've worked on Knative and a bunch of the Google Cloud infrastructure. So um, that's my background. And uh, when we were looking at authorization, I sort of said, I don't really want to build all this stuff myself. And so hmm. that's where the fine folks at OpenFGA came in. Yeah, so I'm Maria, um, currently work at Okta, and I've been working on OpenMGA for almost three years now. You have to give the spoiler alert. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, we got started with a little bit of hand-rolled authorization code, and it got kind of gnarly, and we were talking about adding more, and I was like, no, let's go use OpenFGA. And at the end, you know, it's not, 100% smooth. I'll, I'm going to tell you some of the warts, but I'm also going to throw my mic everywhere. Uh, I have done this before, but apparently that's the first time for this. Sorry, everyone on the recording. Um, hello? Okay, good. Um, would we do it again? Yes. It was definitely the right choice to do, even though um, it doesn't do absolutely everything for you. All right, so I'm going to be talking about what is FGA. So FGA stands for fine-grained authorization as opposed to coarse-grained authorization. And um, throughout my part of the talk, I'm going to be using the analogy of Google Drive. So um, let's say that you're Google Drive and you have to, you know, you have users, you have uh, documents, you have folders. The documents live within folders and uh, you can share, uh, you, can, you can give permissions to someone, to a document, or to a folder, or both. So what FTA does is it answers the questions, can this user do this thing, this action, on this resource or this object? And so an example for Google Drive could be, can user Alice edit the document with ID customers? So how FGA works uh, at a very high level is, first you have to define what we call a model of your permission system, so what are the actors and what things you can do with them. And then you have to write what are the relationships between those uh, objects or between those users. And what FGA does is it builds a graph of that information and it tries to see if there is a, a way of going from the user to the object. And if there is, it returns you know, permission allowed. So how does FGA fit architecturally? There's been a lot of talks in this conference about service meshes. And uh, a service mesh is something that can control how two services talk to one another, so say service A talks to service B. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about whether a user can access a resource within service A or service B. So they really, they solve different problems. But you probably heard a lot about service meshes here, so mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to make, make it clear, OpenFGA is not this service mesh problem, this is a different problem when you've got, you know, in our case, several thousand projects and then users who want to access one particular set of repos and have permissions on that, but they don't get permissions on all the other GitHub repos we manage that belong to other people. Okay, so let's talk about how does OpenFGA work. So FGA needs two pieces of data. The first one is what we call the model. and uh, it's, this is a file that very rarely changes. It's something that maybe you would change when you add a new product or a new service in your application. And uh, it's immutable, so you can only create new models, you cannot delete them. So on the right-hand side of the screen, we have a list of questions that you, the model author, should think about when you write your model. So things like, what are the objects or the users in your system? What actions can you do with each object? And how do those things relate to one another? and if there are hierarchies, so nesting of, of things. On the right-hand side, we have 
what could be a model for Google Drive. So we have several types. We have a user, we have a group, uh, a document, and a folder. And then each of these types has what we call relations. So for example, the type group has a relation called member, and it's assignable to a user. So what this means is I can write a fact or a relationship that says user Evan is uh, a member of group Stacklog, for example. And then for the type document, we have another relation called can view. And it's defined as viewer or owner or viewer from parent. So what this means is if you have the viewer relation, for example, to the, the document, you automatically get the can view relation. And then we have the type folder, which has another relation called parent. So what this means is I can write a fact saying folder A is a parent of folder B, for example. The second piece of information that FGA needs is what we call tuples, or the relationships. So for example, a tuple could be user Maria is an owner of the document budget. And uh, these, are, these facts change all the time. So every time you create a document, you share a document with someone or you delete something, you would write or delete a tuple. And uh, there's an extra API that you can use if you want called the read changes API. This gives you a historical timeline of what changes have been made to the, to the system. So this is the final step, the, the check API. So this is the most important API in FGA. Uh, what it does is um, it performs a graph traversal, like I said before, from the user to the object, and it returns allowed true or false. So this is the example for Google Drive's get document um, endpoint. I'm calling check with the user ID, relation viewer, and uh, the document ID. And notice how there's no role checking, there's no uh, checking for attributes of the user. It's just a simple query. Or in our case, prior to FGA, there would be you know, a SQL query and then maybe some more SQL queries, develop some extra stuff, and figure out all these different things. And we hadn't even gotten that far into our auth system. So being able to replace that with check is real nice basically pulls it out into something separate that the rest of the code doesn't get tangled up with. OK, so this, uh, I'm going to talk about how um, FGA works behind the scenes for the check API that I mentioned. So imagine that the query was, is user Alice related to document customers as a viewer? So here, the target object is document customers. So what FGA does is it goes back to the model. It looks up the relation can view for the document. And the definition is something, something, or viewer from parent. So if you are a viewer of the parent object, which is a folder, then you can, can, you can view this document. OK, so it goes to the tuples, and it finds the parent objects of the document, which in this case is folder sales. And then again, it goes back to the model. What, are the, what is the definition for a viewer folder? It's user, user star, whatever, whatever, or viewer from parent, again. So if you have viewer access on the folder, sorry, on the parent folder, then you get viewer access on this folder. So it goes to the tuples, and it sees, OK, folder prospects is a parent of folder sales. OK, so final step, back to the model. Who is a viewer of a, of a folder? Um, and the, the first uh, operand is a user. So it says, define viewer as a user. So this means is I can write a tuple saying the user is a viewer of the folder. So in this case, it looks at the tuples and it sees, uh, oh, user Alice is a viewer of folder prospects. And so we solved the query and we found that there is a path from the user to the object. And so allow is true. You can do this with nested SQL queries yourself, but it's not pretty. <laughs> Would not recommend. You need you to, to you need them. to tell them that's this previous step of writing the tuples. Okay. If you'll go back, yeah, this. So you, have to you write need it. to push from the application so when I these relationships. Okay. Yeah, uh, we have a batch process when we were doing our migration that went and pushed all that in the first time, and then we keep it up to date after that. Yeah, he's gonna talk about that later. Um, okay, so a bit about the benefits of OpenFGA. The first big one is you avoid OWASP mistakes. So we have the list there of the top 10 OWASP risks. And well, OpenFGA solves three of them. So risk number one and number five 
are basically the same thing. They're uh, the issue where a user has access to something that they shouldn't. So let's say I try to access, I don't know, documents super secret, and there's no, there's no check for permissions in the get documents endpoint, then so now my application is at risk because I have access to something that I shouldn't. So the solution to this is every single endpoint should have a call to the check API. And you can do this in a middleware very easily. You can put this, uh, this check here, this could live in a middleware. We actually implemented gRPC middleware because we're using gRPC and we use annotations on our RPCs to say, when you're making this call, you need this permission. Here's, you know, here's a standard pattern for where to find the objects that you do the authorization on. So um, all of that is basically declarative and you can go look at the file and say, oh, to do this, I need this permission over here. Um, okay, Obviously, so you can write your own middleware however you want. Um, the, the second risk that OpenFGA solves is, um, let's say that your documents have a field called deleted at, and I somehow have permission, or I can somehow edit the deleted at field. So what just happened? I could delete a document that I shouldn't have been allowed to. So this is very common with GraphQL queries. And again, the solution is maybe modify the patch document endpoint so that if you try to modify a field in an object, then you again call the check API to verify that you can actually change that field. Okay, some more benefits. Auditability um, is a big one for, especially for security engineers. Previously, uh, yeah, pre-OpenFGA world, you would have to look at all the code to, well, all the, all the bits of authorization that lived within the code to see how that actually happens. But now there's only one thing that you have to audit, which is the model, this, this file right here. Um, so that makes things easier, I think. And, um, or at least if you yeah. can make sure that there's a check call in the path, then you just need to audit the, mod the model. Right. So if you'd use middleware or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and the second part that is very easy to audit is the, the historical view of um, who requested access to what, because those are logged in the check API calls. Uh, decoupling is, uh, if we go back to the check API code, uh, if you see here, it doesn't matter what the model is or what the tuples are, this check call stays the same. Maybe if you update the model and then uh, the relation is not viewer anymore, it's viewer, uh, it's scan view. Okay, you have to change the, the name of the relation. But this code pretty much stays the same all the time. Uh, the third one, consistent API for developers. Again, check API is pretty simple, standard API, and everyone in the company uses that, so it's easier on, any, um, on everyone. Um, enforcement of authorization across service or product boundaries. This is about the model, so it is pretty easy to extend this model um, to include other features. So you can imagine uh, that, for example, this is just for the Google Drive now, but there's no reason why they could not add more types and relations for Google Sheets or Google Docs. And with one FGA service, you can have people who are a member of group and have that group apply evenly and seamlessly across you know, your, drive sheet, your drive service and your sheet service and so forth. Um, so you can kind of have one FGA under layer across many different microservices that you're running. Uh, there's a second part to this, and that's that you can actually uh, split this model into separate files, and then they get all combined. This is a feature called modular models, and what this allows is that every unit in the company can write their own sub-model, and then uh, it's, it's all one big file in the end, one big model. Um, and then uh, FGA supports attribute-based or conditional authorization. What this means is I can change the model so that I can write a tuple, for example, saying user Evan is a uh, viewer of document budget only when the IP address is this or when the timestamp is this. And then FGA takes that, uh, that information and then in the check request, I send the, the current IP address or the current timestamp 
and it merges the, the two and it arrives at that decision. Some more benefits, um, availability. So you can deploy FGA and scale it independently of other apps. Um, correctness, we have battle tested this so that Check API always responds to, with the right uh, response. And uh, low latency. So this is not login, right? This is authorization, so it's not gonna happen once. It's gonna happen many times during the course of a, of a second, maybe. So we, we work really hard to keep the latency of Check API low. And one of the ways that you can control that is you can turn on a flag on the server uh, to enable in-memory caching. And this, cap, of course, comes with the cost of staleness, so you can get a staler response if you enable it. Evan, all yours. Oh, yeah, so um, the line counts may not seem like a lot, but this is going from a model that basically just had owners to a model that had um, five total roles and hierarchical permissions so that we could actually have enclosing projects that, that contain other projects. And altogether, we ended up with half the code and substantially less entangling. So um, that's the history. You know, Minder's an open source project. So you, if you're curious later, you can go look at these PRs. Um, and you can see that, you know, in many cases, uh, you know, there was less code, but more capability. So, yeah, that's the, that's the ad part of this. <laughs> and um, one of the other things that I really liked is um, you've got this model file where you describe these relations. You can also write tests to test that you've actually built those models to produce the results that you want for authorization. And then you can run those tests continuously. And so if someone, um, you know, goes and adds a new role, you say, okay, who, who, under which circumstances should this happen, and which circumstances should this not? And unlike if you've got your code tied in, your authorization code in the middle of all your other stuff, you don't have to stand up, you know, a mock database and a bunch of other things to see that, hey, you know, this user admin one has permissions to create a provider, for example. Um, you know, testing that in the, you know, exhaustively in your normal case uh, might be, you know, 200 lines of test code. And instead, it's a little declarative file that lets us validate that we're actually making the author authorization decisions that we want. Um, another thing that I really liked is that we can actually explain the access. So you say, you know, hey, why does Maria have access to this project? Well, it's because this and this and this. And you can actually ask OpenFGA and it will explain, hey, this is, you know, everyone who has access to this object, or this is everything Maria has access to, or this is why Maria has this specific access. And so um, as you're looking at these FGA things, this is a really key um, capability if you're moving your, your, author, your authorization decisions out, you want to be able to explain to auditors and potentially even open up as an API call, hey, why do I have this access so that your customers can do that for themselves? Um, another thing that is nice is that since you're putting these tuples out in OpenFGA and it's about these relationships, you can actually add new roles later, for example, and you need to update the model in FGA, but um, you don't necessarily need to go in and do a bunch of other adjustments. And so you can see here, we added a policy writer, and um, it was probably 100 lines or so is my guess in that. And we, you know, we updated this, we updated the um, tests, and then we updated the allowed set of strings to include policy writer. And that was you know, for the, the roles that we accept. And all of a sudden, we had a policy writer role who could write policies but couldn't necessarily view other stuff. Um, that was a lot less work than it would have been if we were hand rolling all of our, all of our authorization code. So now we're all excited. But um, as a software engineer, I also believe that everything comes with trade offs. And I'm going to be honest with you, and there are trade offs here. So let's talk about some of the parts 
that can be a little bit more of a pain. So um, this cool thing, you know, we talked about step two, you push these tuples into OpenFGA. You've basically made some piece of your database into a separate service. Um, and then when you go to, you know, ask questions like, you know, what are our top, you know, who, who are the users of our top projects? Well, we're using OpenFGA and we're using Keycloak. So to answer that, I can go and look at our usage tables and I can find our top projects. And then after that, I can look at each of our top projects and I have to ask OpenFGA, hey, who has permissions on these? I can't look at that in our main database because that's not where, our, that's, not where that's stored. It's stored in OpenFGA. And so I get back from that a list of user tuples. Well, our user tuples are users in Keycloak. We don't store their email address because they might change or update that. So then I need to go to Keycloak and I need to go and resolve all of those to email addresses so that um, our PMs can go and contact our top users and tell them either, you know, here's a new feature or, you know, thanks for, you know, thanks for using the service or anything like that. So um, it becomes a little extra work to do some of these analytical queries and so forth. Um, that was, I think, one of, the, one of the first cases where we encountered something where it was like, oh, and, you know, we, we just had to change this process a little bit. Um, also, we've had one or two cases where we didn't think very carefully about which place we delete data from first or which place we create data from first. And uh, we ended up in some cases with clearing out someone's permission to see, for example, a project before we deleted that project itself. And in that case, um, we ended up with an orphaned project that nobody could delete because um, we just cleared out everyone's permission to do anything with it. Um, and so we had to go in and do a manual database cleanup by hand. And in the meantime, um, I think it blocked Danya's project back there from being recreated. Um, so you have to think a little bit about the order because you don't get a two-phase, you know, you don't get a two-phase commit or any kind of transactional thing between OpenFGA and your other database. If you figure out your order, get things right. Um, I would say, uh, well, this is for creating, I would do things to FGA first and then to the database and use something like a UUID or something that's going to be unique. When you're tearing things down, do it in the opposite order. Um, but just figure out what your strategy is there and have a system to sync the two if needed. Um, and you're running another service. Um, I know everybody here is cloud native, and so they love running as many services as you can get your hands on. Got to catch them all. Um, but uh, you know, you got another database. You need to do backups. You need to do monitoring. Check if it's up. Check and see if you've hit Docker Hub image pull rate limits. Um, you know, all that good stuff. So um, there is a Helm chart. It's helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, you're running it. You own it. Um, and yeah, there's a. It sounds great, just add the check call. But there's, there's more than just the check call involved. And so expect to invest a little bit in tooling that makes this fit into your ecosystem. Um, in our case, we ended up writing our own middleware for gRPC. Maybe there's something out there that does that. Feel free to steal ours if you want. I actually think it's kind of nice. Um, but uh, you know, that was something else we had to write. Um, we actually were in Go, so we store the user you know, we validate the user's jot, and then we store that identity in the context. Our next middleware is OpenFGA, and it pulls the user's jot out of the context, and then, you know, ties it in, um, sends it, you know, does the check and all that stuff. You also, all those tuples, you need some user-facing way for users to write them. Um, that's, that's your API. OpenFGA is not going to tell you exactly how that needs to look, so you are going to have to write an API that is, you know, grant user permission on this thing, or, um, you know, here's, you know, how to manage a group or whatever that API looks like, or you know, web page if you're just a web page person. Um, and we tied our FGA tests into Go test, um, which is kind of a little fun bit of hackery where we wrote a test that shells out to the FGA tester and then exits with the right code so that. If you break your model, your go test fails, even though it's 
running a different binary. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know. I think app devs, this makes your life easier because you get this declarative model and then you're like, ah, uh, and that's FGA's problem to fix and, and make fast and everything else. Um, I think it probably makes the security engineer's life easier. If you're a security engineer and you think I'm full of it, then you know, talk to me, I'd love to hear your take. But you, know, you get to say, hey, here's a standard piece. You know, this works just like the other stuff. Um, and I think it helps end users because you get these richer models where you can have you know, folders and inheritance and groups and things like that um, more consistently through all the different products you manage as opposed to, um, I also have to deal with Amazon IEM, and that's kind of the opposite of this, where you know, every little thing, like this RPC you know, has a special form, and you need to know, like, oh, you know, IRNs, ARNs are shaped like this over here, and there's, there's no transitive access that you get. You have to spell every single thing out. And while that's great from a detailed access point of view, um, it also means the first three times I grant permissions, I don't get it right, and I have to go back and add something else. Um, and hopefully FGA will make it so that most users can just do one grant and they get access to the right stuff. And um, as an engineer who's interested in security, usability is the first piece of security. If people can't use it, then all hope is lost. Yeah, so our stack, you know, we wrote some OAuth code to begin with. We replaced it with Keycloak. We were happy with that. Um, we wrote an access control system ourselves. We replaced that with OpenFGA. We're happy with that. Um, there's this dream that someday maybe we could just replace everything with these you know, services that do stuff well. But I don't know. I suspect that we'll probably have a core of stuff that is unique to us. Um, and yeah. Saves you some work, doesn't save everything. Moves, moves the problem around on the plate. Still have to eat your peas sometime. Thanks. Happy to take questions or, you know, complaints. <laughs> what the heck are you talking about? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm ask one question. I'm gonna repeat it for the recording, and then I'll answer it, and then ask the next next one. Okay. Okay. So the question, if I understand correctly, um, the context is Uber, and in most cases they are checking whether or not a user is a member of a group yes. in order to do authorization rather than checking individual users. Um, let me rewind our slides a lot. So the rest of the question is, you need to load your users into the OpenFGA model. So if you look at this authorization model here, you do need to load the user memberships of groups. Like this user is a member of, you know, let's say you've got uh, a group that's drivers and a group that's riders, just to pick on, you know, a super simple I, I, example idea. You would need to mark each user as being a member of drivers or a member of riders or something like that. Um, but once that happens, there are a bunch of other resources that you could potentially get access to based on the group membership. So if you look at how viewer down there uh, in folder is defined as it's either a user, the user colon star means all users, or is a member of a group. So from that you can build out, hey, you know, here's the stack lock people, um, and that's a group. And uh, so this group doesn't, this definition of group only has member is a user. But you could also have member is a user or a group member. So you could have groups that are members of other groups. So this, this also we checked on this like issue a call to whatever user management service, right? Mm -hmm.
So to, to continue this and repeating your, your bit back for everyone else in the recording, um, it sounds like you have an existing service that when you go and fetch information about a user, you get back a list of all the groups that the user is in. Um, and then how do you present that information to OpenFGA is, is the question I'm hearing. Um, this sounds very much like an auth system that I worked with many years ago that uh, had a similar process of returning your group memberships and actually had a, had a hard coded limit of you can only be in 5,000 groups, um, which sounds like a lot. And uh, when it got exceeded, the results were hilarious and someone had to manually go in and figure out how to cut things down so that you were under, under 5,000 groups. Um, uh, the, the replacement of that system ended up moving much of the group membership out of the user identity system and into an FGA-like system. So instead of when you query the user system finding out what groups, intransitive groups, a user is a member of, that's where you got to the 5,000. Well, people weren't directly members of 5,000 groups, but you were a member of, you know, Seattle stack lock production on call, and that was a member of production on call, and production on call was a member of, you know, platform team and so forth. And when you start expanding all of those things out, people could hit 5,000 different groups that they were a part of. And um, moving that into FGA meant that you didn't end up trying to pass all that group information through each application in order to figure out the access. So that would be how I would approach things, would be to try to move your group membership out of your authentication system and into your AuthZ system. Um, but obviously that's easy for me to say up here on stage and um, maybe harder for you to do in practice. I know that at that previous employer it was a multi-year project. So this is like a role base and this is a relationship. Yes. We have reasons to use them groups because So, mm -hmm. so uh, the, the rejoinder is um, that they have a user management system and they'd like to have a good user experience for the user management system and FGA may not provide that. So, um, Let's see, I think I have a slide that helps a little bit here. So the fun and exciting thing here that's a little bit hidden away is um, OpenFGA is never a front door that users directly interact with. It's something that developers interact with and if you have that user management system, it might be the thing that writes tuples of you, this user is a member of this group into OpenFGA um, I wouldn't expect end users to ever see OpenFGA. Like when we made the transition in Minder from our hand-rolled code to OpenFGA, um, there was no user visible change, except that we added a bunch of new roles, but that was, that was our choice, and that was not a requirement of switching over to OpenFGA. That was just, hey, look, we can add a new feature at the same time, and we weren't real disciplined about one transition and then the other. Um, Uh, the question is the difference between OpenFGA and SpiceDB, and uh, you're probably a better expert than I. Yeah, I think it's, it comes down to features and how, so OpenFGA and SpiceDB are both based on one paper from Google called Sansibar, and uh, there's some choices that we made and they made, uh, and that makes um, the products different. So they're, they're both related, and yeah, the Zanzibar paper is really where it all started. And yeah. They're, they're both implementations, different implementations of one problem. Good. Um, so as I'm, this sounds really interesting, and I'm kind of thinking about, like, as I'm thinking about it, I'm like, oh, what if we took, in the Kubernetes project, what if we tried to re-implement RBAC on top of mm -hmm. OpenFGA? One of the things that... There's a... Go ahead. Is that our, I don't know, because it's already happened. But uh, um, seems like part of that would be writing Uh, writing a different storage backend. Is that something mere mortals can do, or 
Um, we don't have a pluggable system yet, but you can write your own storage adapter, yeah. So to repeat the question just for the people in the audience, um, uh, thinking about this in the context of Kubernetes, um, would it be possible or feasible to use a relationship-based mo model like this uh, to define Kubernetes authorization rather than the current RBAC model? And um, if so, how difficult is it to plug in a new storage backend because OpenFGA currently supports Postgres and MySQL, and neither of those are what Kubernetes would probably want as their backing storage. Um, so there was actually a talk at KubeCon EU where someone did build this, but they used either the MySQL or the Postgres, I don't know which, um, backend, but they did plug it in and get a system that could interpret, um, you know, permissions and apply them to a Kubernetes cluster to get, you know, stuff like QBAR back, but also be able to say like, hey, you have permissions on this deployment, so you have permissions to delete the pods in this deployment, but maybe not de delete pods in some other deployment or something like that, because you've got these relationships that you can understand. Um, There's a video on YouTube. Yeah, it's... So to repeat that, um, you said it was federated, federated IAM with OpenFGA is the video? Federated IAM for Kubernetes with OpenFGA. Federated IAM for Kubernetes with OpenFGA. It's on YouTube, and there's an associated source code repo. It's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. But when I start to look at, you know, okay, I'm a user and the app is pulling all of the resources that I have access to, so it's more of a list operation than a yeah. detail operation. And then within the app, I can, I, you know, I've seen some of the source code, so I'm like, I know they're, they're pulling all of the things the user yep. has authorization to within the database query, and then that's joined with multiple tables, mm -hmm. pulling those details. Does that authorization logic just still stay in the database in a simple case, or do you take that out and then back it with, so, so the question is, you know, when this comes to the real world and some existing applications that, for example, have, you know, things like list a bunch of my stuff, um, and the way that's implemented today is calls into the database that include links to other resources and so forth, and sort of a set of joins to figure out what you have access to and so on. Um, if you're moving to an FGA type world, uh, how does that translate, and what would the code look like? And uh, my take, at least, would be that you actually want to take that out of the database and out of those SQL queries. What we're doing um, for, like, get, what projects do I have access to, for example, is we're going to open FGA first. And we're saying, hey, list all of the objects that I have access to. I believe there's also a bulk check API. Yes. So you can database. get a whole bunch of the resources from the database that you think make sense and then pass them all to open FGA in one call and get back a yes, yes, no, 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 yes, no um, list, which you can use to filter out, yeah. depending so, on which way makes more sense. Or you can go, or go the other way and grab from the open FGA. Or you can go from open FGA and say, hey, what are all the documents I have access to, and then get back a paginated list and figure out how to deal with it. You know, if it was, doc, if it was you know, organizations, it would make probably more sense than if it were like specific individual documents in a Google Drive case. But, yeah, you can go. You can go either way, but I would, I would aim to get all of those joins and stuff out of the SQL database and the kind of squishy application code, and get them behind the Check API. There's two APIs that we also offer aside from Check. One is called List Objects, so give me the list of things that I have access to. The other one is List Users, so what users have access to this thing. So you can use that. <laughs> 